much for coming. There it is. Um, welcome to the Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence event. I'm your host, Isabella, and we're so excited to have you all here. Um, during this event, we're going to discuss whether robots could, in principle, be conscious. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Kobus, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Kung with us today to share their expertise on this topic. Um, if you have any questions during the discussion, feel free to use the Q&A function, and the professors will answer them at the end of the event. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Kobus to begin his presentation. Thank you, Isabella. It's a real treat for me to do this. Uh, I'm an emeritus faculty member in the ASU philosophy department. In the 1990s, together with Brad Armand, I designed and taught one of the earliest courses in the US in philosophy of computing. I retired in 2018. Emeritus is an honorific that they give you if you're a professor who retires and you do not fuck up in a major way. So I'm very proud of that title. In my 10 minutes, I will state 10 claims that are controversial within philosophy and within cognitive science and AI, but that I think are plausible. So uh, 10 statements in 10 minutes. Number one, all consciousness has a what it is like aspect. Thomas Nagel wrote a famous paper called, What is it like to be a bat? And I think that's basically right. In consciousness, there's at least one quality that is present to a subject, the smell of a rose, the sight of red, the sensation of pain, of, of a migraine, the pleasure of an orgasm, the emotional high of joy, the low of depression. So that's the first statement. All consciousness has a what it is like aspect. The second statement is, uh, what it is likeness involves a presentation to a subject. A quality is presented to the subject through itself. The quality is both what it is present, what is presented, and also the way in which it is presented. So, in any conscious being, at least one quality is presented through itself to a subject. That's the second statement. The third statement is: all intelligence involves some consciousness. Intelligence has an essential nature in virtue of which it is real intelligence and not merely simulated intelligence. Compare a computer simulation of the flow of water. It's not really flowing water because there is no H2O there. Similarly, for a computer simulation of intelligence, if there's no consciousness in it, then it's not really intelligence. An essential aspect of intelligence would be missing if it's not conscious. So it would be only a simulation of intelligence, not real intelligence, if it's not conscious. That's the third statement. Now the fourth statement is consciousness goes quite far down in the animal kingdom. Uh, animals have sensory perception. Any animal that has sensory perception is conscious. Arthropods, for example, insects and spiders have sensory perception. Bees can sense the colors of flowers. So since it is sensory perception, and it's not merely registering information, the bee has a bit of phenomenal consciousness. So that's the fourth statement. And the fifth statement is, um, in the history of AI, the patterns of success and failure have turned out to be extremely interesting and difficult to predict. Many people have predicted an AI will soon be able to do X and they've turned out to be dramatically wrong. Conversely, many have predicted an AI will never be able to do Y and it turned out they've been proven to be dramatically wrong. So the history of AI shows an interesting pattern of successes and failures that are very hard to predict. That's the fifth statement. The sixth statement is an AI can surprise its creators. Some people say computers can only do what their programmers tell them to do. I say no. Often computers do things that are extremely surprising to their creators. The seventh statement is one pattern that has emerged in the history of AI is that 
domain specific tasks turn out to be tractable, but domain general tasks turn out to be incredibly hard. So for example, uh, common sense is domain general and common sense turns out to be incredibly hard. On the other hand, being able to play chess or the Asian board game Go turns out to be extremely, uh, well, not extremely easy, but it turns out to be solvable for an AI. So domain specific tasks tend to be tractable. Domain general tasks tend to be intractable. That's a theme that harks back to uh, Descartes and Turing, two people who have reflected philosophically on uh, the potential of a machine. So that's the seventh statement. The eighth statement is, there's currently no strong reason to believe that any AI is conscious. Some people disagree. For example, Christoph Koch, a famous AI uh, practitioner and theorist believes that the internet has some consciousness, that an automated Waymo car has some consciousness, that the Leila chess engine has some consciousness. He believes that because he's got an information integration theory of consciousness. I disagree. I don't think information integration is in and of itself sufficient for consciousness. I don't think any current AI is conscious. And so I don't think any current AI is really intelligent. So that's the eighth statement. The ninth statement is new AI architectures are coming online all the time. There's a number of new ones in the pipeline. A recent one is called transformer architectures applied to natural language a transformer architecture AI called GPT-3 is able to simulate uh, natural language speech to a remarkable degree. Uh, what will happen when many of these new AIs come to fruition? Will any of them be conscious? Um, I don't know the answer. Uh, I think that the answer may very well be yes. My conjecture is that the answer is yes. The conjecture is plausible, but nobody knows whether it is true. The rational stance, I think, is cautiously optimistic agnosticism about whether any AI will ever be conscious. Probably, but who knows? Uh, I think that's the rational stance. And so that's my ninth claim. And then my 10th and last claim is, um, if, a, if a future AI surprises us with some capacity such that the best way to explain that capacity is that it has consciousness, then that will be the epistemic basis for saying that it is conscious. Um, we do that now, I think, for many non-human animals, even for arthropods, for insects and spiders. I think there's strong reason to think that they're phenomenally conscious because some of the things they do, the best way to explain what they do uh, involves attributing phenomenal consciousness to them. That's a holistic epistemology. All sorts of factors have to be taken into account. The same is true for new AIs. Will it ever happen? Uh, the rational stance, I think, should be is uh, cautiously optimistic agnosticism. And so that's my 10th and last statement. I think that's about 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kobus. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A, um, and then we can get back to them at the end of the event. Um, now we will hear from Dr. Phillips. Dr. Phillips, I think you might be muted. Okay, try again. Good now? It's to all of us, yes, we hear you now. Okay, so the first thing I wanna say is that I think we should be skeptical about the reliability of our intuitions about consciousness, about the scope of consciousness. 
So there's a, a large body of research which shows that we are hardwired to automatically and unconsciously and very rapidly recognize um, the emotions and mental states of other human beings. So for example, there's a huge body of research on how we just automatically and very, very rapidly recognize emotions based on facial cues. And there's, there's good reasons for that, right? Where humans are very social beings. And so there's reproductive and survival value in being able to just automatically and rapidly recognize um, emotions in other human beings. So those um, the intuitions that are driven by these mechanisms, recognizing emotions and other men mental states and other humans, they're not designed to cover um, non-human animals and certainly not um, robots. So unless you have independent reasons for thinking that our intuitions about the scope of consciousness are reliable as opposed to just socially useful, I think we should be very careful in relying, using intuitions to settle these sorts of debates. So I don't give much evidential weight to arguments um, with premises that rely on intuitions about the scope of consciousness. There can be useful starting points for debates about, for constructing theories, but I don't think they have much evidential weight for those sorts of reasons I just sketched. So I think we need to be pretty open-minded about what kinds of um, things are consciousness. And so the question is how open-minded. So I thought I'd start by talking about uh, what's referred to as AGI, so artificial general intelligence. So this is, uh, these are AI systems that don't exist now, but um, in principle, um, perhaps they could exist in the future. Uh, these are systems that have um, human level intelligence. So like Bernie was talking about before, domain general flexible problem solving abilities. So it's the ability to solve problems by drawing on sensory systems, various cognitive systems um, in a reasonably flexible manner. Because suppose we have um, an AI, an AGI, that is not only an AGI, it's not only exhibiting human level general intelligence, but is functionally identical to a human being. And so what I mean by that is that it processes information in the exact same way as a human being. So it has this, you know, the same inputs and the same outputs. So the outputs are pieces of behavior. It could be you know, verbal behavior. And all the intermediary processing inside of the system is the same as a human being. And so the only difference, right, is just the hardware. Okay, so it's, a, it's a, an AGI that is a functional duplicate of a human being. So I find it very difficult to think of evidence that would count, cause us to deny that such a, an AI system would have consciousness. So if you asked, like Bernie was saying before, if you asked the system, are you conscious? Um, are you feeling the pain, for example? It it'll say yes, right? Because it's the same inputs and the same, same, same outputs as a human being. Um, if you observe the behavior of that AGI, it's gonna be the same type of behavior as a human being. So I can't think of um, any piece of evidence that would count against such a system having consciousness. Um, so S Susan Sch Schneider has a, a book that came out uh, a few years ago called Artificial You, which I'd highly recommend if you're interested in reading more on this, these kinds of topics. And in it, she poses this um, test, which is um, relevant to what I was just saying, called the chip test. And she says, maybe what we can do is we can um, get artificial chips and we can implant them in human brains. And so we can see, let these chips take over the job of certain populations of neurons. So suppose we put it in the area of your brain responsible for face recognition. So this part of your brain called the FFA, the fusiform face area. So, so somehow we just um, inhibit the activity of that, that population of neurons and this chip takes over the job of those neurons. And so the thought is that um, once you've implanted this chip, right, and it's processing this information using this artificial hardware, maybe you'll no longer consciously see faces, right? You might just see um, the edges of heads, you might see certain colors and motion, but you just won't consciously experience the faces. Maybe that will tell you that this artificial hardware is not compatible with conscious visual processing of faces, right? So this, this would be a test for AI consciousness. And so, um, I think that's a pretty interesting suggestion, um, but I don't think it quite works in the case of this AGI that's a functional duplicate of a human being, right? Because so long as the inputs going into this artificial chip and the outputs are exactly the same, 
the person who has the chip inside them is going to say the same things. They're going to say, yes, I can consciously see the face. Um, they're going to pass all the same tests. They're going to be behaviorally indistinguishable because this chip is going to have these outputs feeding into the, to their memory systems, to their verbal centers in the exact same way as the person without the chip. So even that person, they're not going to be able to tell any difference, right? That you, you'd ask them afterwards, did, did you see the face? And so their memory system is going to be, have been influenced in the exact same way because it received, received the exact same inputs. And that's the case, even if this chip, even if the processing within this chip is different from the processing that occurs within the population of neurons that's temporarily replacing, right? So for that reason, I think it's going to be very difficult, um, if not impossible, to find any, any evidence that an AGI that's functionally identical to a human being um, does not have consciousness. Um, so, if, so the question is, if um, could AI in principle be consciousness? My answer is yes, and I find it very difficult to think of evidence that would suggest otherwise for certain types of um, artificial intelligences like AGI, the type of AGIs I just suggested. Okay. What about other types of AI, right? That are not functional duplicates of human beings. So they process information in very different ways. What should we say about those? Um, well, I don't know what to say about those. I'm kind of with Bernie here. I'm, um, I'm a little bit agnostic. But what I think we should do is adopt something like a precautionary principle, like people do when it comes to animal, non-human animal consciousness. So, you know, there are debates about whether invertebrates um, and certain vertebrates such as fish have consciousness. And one very popular view in those debates is that we should adopt something like a, pre a precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle says something like this, if the creature has at least one credible indi indicator of consciousness, then for all intents and purposes, we should treat that creature as a conscious being, even if we don't know decisively one way or the other. Okay, so the question is, what is a credible indicator of consciousness? And so the thought here is that as theorists, we can come together, even if we have different theories on what consciousness consists in, we can agree on what are some of the credible indicators. So these are going to be behaviors, um, neurophysiological phenomena that are robustly correlated with conscious experiences. So these phenomena might be causes of conscious experiences. They might be byproducts of conscious experiences. So different theories will say different things about that. But the thought is that we can agree as theorists that there is a, um, a set of credible indicators of consciousness. And so uh, an AI system um, that processes inf information in a very different manner than us or a non-human animal, so long as it exhibits at least one of those indicators, we should deploy this precautionary principle. Okay, so let me just give you one example of a precautionary principle. I mean, sorry, of a credible indicator. And this sort of uh, picks up on something Bernie was talking about before integration. So I think processing information in a very integrative manner is a credible indicator of consciousness. And let me give you just one example. So vision scientists distinguish between two uh, visual systems, what's called the ventral system and what's called the dorsal system. And so the dorsal system um, runs up into your par parietal lobe here and the ventral system goes down into your temporal lobe here. And the ventral system is responsible for consciously recognizing objects, right? So you recognize the mug in front of you, right? And then you form memories about the mug, you can verbalize what you're seeing, you can perform and so on. And then we have the dorsal stream, which is responsible for, 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 sorry, for performing actions on objects. So, it's, so it tells your motor system what type of grip size to select and how to adjust that grip as your hand gets closer to the mug and the pressure you should, you should um, put on the mug. And so there's evidence that those two systems are dissociable. So if you get damage to one part of your brain, you could have um, the other stream intact. Um, so there's a condition called visual agnosia. If you get damage to the ventral stream here, you can no longer recognize objects. You can't, you can't say what you're seeing, right? You can't recognize it as a mug. You might be able to recognize it by touching it, but, but, but not by seeing it. But you can still perform actions on objects. You can still grasp at the mug and pick up the mug. So there is these really interesting studies where the people, they can't tell you what they're seeing, but they can still perform actions on them. They can walk around them. They can pick them up. And then there's another condition called optic ataxia, 
And these people, they can recognize objects, they can tell you that's a mug I'm seeing, but they can't perform the correct actions on them, they have trouble gripping the object. So there's this dis dissociation between these two types of vision. And what's interesting is that um, the vision for action, the dorsal stream, um, seems to be largely unconscious, the processes that occur within that system. Whereas the ventral stream responsible for recognizing what you're seeing seems to be largely conscious. And so one um, view on why that is the case is that it's because the ventral stream, the outputs of the ventral stream are widely accessible to other systems within your mind. So the outputs are accessible to your verbal center so you can say what you're seeing. It's accessible to your you know, short-term and long-term memory systems so you can remember what you saw um, and various other systems in your mind. Whereas the thought is that this, vent, this dorsal stream responsible for performing actions on the objects you see, it's relatively isolated, the processing within that stream. So those outputs get sent to your motor systems to control the grip size and so on, but it's those outputs don't get sent to your belief forming systems in central cognition or your verbal centers or your long-term memory centers. And so I think it's pretty plausible that there's something about um, that type of difference between isolated processing versus processing that's widely available to other systems and could get integrated into other systems that might be a credible, a credible indicator of consciousness. So if we have an AI system that is processing information in a very different manner than um, we do, it's not a functional duplicate. Um, so long as it's exhibiting a, a significant degree of integrated processing, I think that should be considered a credible indicator of consciousness. And so maybe we should use this something like a precautionary principle. Okay, so that's just one example. We can talk about other examples of credible indicators in the um, Q and A, but you might have borderline cases. You might have some borderline cases. West, 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 west. Come on, mic on. So you might have some borderline cases where it's not clear whether this should count as a credible indicator. And so maybe that's a case where we have to have some pragmatism, right? We, we have to think about what would be the harms that might arise if we don't include this indicator on the list of, list of credible, credible indicators. So what if these systems are conscious? What are the harms they might be exposed to if we don't um, have a precautionary principle that encompasses them? And maybe there are some harms that might arise from including too many systems, um, you know, including too many credible indicators, indicators in the list of credible indicators. And so maybe that would have their own harms. So I think there's gonna to have to be some sort of cost benefit analysis um, involved in developing this sort of precautionary principle. Okay, so just to sum up, I think that if the, if the, if the question is, um, is it possible in principle for AI to be conscious? I think yes, and I find it very difficult to, um, to give evidence that would um, suggest otherwise. If, um, and as for other types of systems beyond functionally identical AGI, um, I think we have to develop some sort of precautionary principle, which is gonna involve a lot of philosophical work and it's gonna involve some ethical theorizing, um, but just like people are doing in debates about animal consciousness, the same sort of precautionary principle should be developed for um, AI systems. Okay, that'll do for me. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. We'll now hear from Dr. Kung. Thank you so much. I've got some slides to share. Hi, so I'm Peter Kung. I'm, I'm relatively new to the ASU philosophy department. I've um, been interested in this topic for a long time. I was actually an undergraduate major in computer science before and worked as a programmer for a number of years before becoming a philosopher. Um, so I want to take a slightly different tack on the, the problem that, uh, that then Bernie and Ben did. So uh, we want to separate two questions, right? So for many of you, this will be familiar, right? The difference between the metaphysical question, what does it take for an AI to be conscious? And then the epistemological question about how we tell whether an AI is conscious, right? So we might look for a theory to tell us, you know, like a theory of what it takes for an AI to be conscious, like Ben was offering us a, a certain kind of a, sort of a framework for a theory that says a system that's sort of sharing information widely where the information information is integrated across a, a large, uh, the whole system, that is a good candidate for uh, a system that's conscious. There's a separate question, I think, a separate but related question about how we tell 
and in particular, how we lay people tell whether an AI is conscious. So this distinction between metaphysics and epistemology is very familiar. I'm just going to go through it fast, right? So you often hear people saying, saying stuff like somebody is innocent until proven guilty, and that is just a category error, right? Uh, so the metaphysics is about what it is, and epistemology is how you tell. So the metaphysics of crime is about whether or not the suspect in fact committed the crime and whether you're proven guilty is whether it has been shown to some particular standard whether the suspect has been committed the crime and those are of course different things a person can commit a crime and we are completely unable to show nobody is able to show that they committed the crime and there can be people who have been shown to a particular epistemic standard that they've committed a crime and when they didn't actually do it so those are different things. So innocent until proven guilty is sort of a category error. So the metaphysical question is about what does it take for AI to be conscious? And that's the kind of answer that Ben was allude, the kind of theories that Ben was alluding to, right? It's going to be a technical scientific answer. Then there's this question about how it is that we ordinary lay people can tell whether, a, how can we tell whether an AI is, AI is conscious? So how do we who, do, who don't have any particular scientific expertise tell that an AI is conscious? And that is a separate question, right? So you know, we can ask that question about human beings. What does it take for a human being to be conscious? Or what does it take for a non-human animal to be conscious? And that's presumably going to be some kind of complicated cognitive scientific theory, right? Uh, but we also want to be like, how do we human beings, how do we other human beings, non-scientists, -scient, non non-cognitive scientists, how do we tell whether human beings are conscious, right? So I have all sorts of beliefs about who, and, who is and who is not conscious, or what sort of beings are or are not conscious. And I'm not a cognitive scientist, so I'm not doing that by sort of one at a time taking these beings into my lab and saying they, they fit my, my theory. So I've got to have some more general way of telling when something is conscious. So how do I, how do I know, for example, whether Ben is conscious? Uh, so this is the kind of classical problem of other minds. How do I know where somebody like Ben is conscious? Well, I don't directly observe Ben's conscious states, right? So that seemed, that's the sort of what generates the problem of other minds. And I can go through that if, if, we, if we want. Um, so you know, the answer that I find somewhat compelling, and this is more or less the answer that Bernie sketched in his 10th statement, is that, look, it's not uncommon for a scientific theory to postulate unobservable things. So it is true that I cannot directly observe Ben's conscious states. I can observe Ben's behavior, but I don't have direct access to his conscious states. But yet I still think Ben is conscious. And why do I think so? Well, I think that you know, a theory that attributes consciousness to human beings is the theory that's going to sort of best explain and predict human behavior, right? So a theory that includes that Ben is conscious is going to best explain and predict Ben's behavior. And so that's basically what Bernie was saying in his 10th statement about arthropods. He thinks, look, arthropods are the sort of things that they exhibit behaviors where the best explanation of their behavior is that they have some conscious states. They have rudimentary conscious states. So what I, what I think is true, and the reason why this seems, the reason why I'm taking this tack is because I think that we are less willing to defer to experts when, when it comes to AI consciousness, when it comes to artificial intelligence. So with other human beings, we're sort of willing to sort of just we have this view that other people, other human beings are consciousness and more war willing to defer to scientists who tell us, well, arthropods are conscious or dogs are conscious or and here's what the here's what the conscious experience of dogs are like. But we're less willing to do that with artificial beings. And so this is, you know, the this is, I think, Ben's plea for caution here was about the potential for moral catastrophe, right? So we create a bunch of beings in our lab and we don't realize or we don't acknowledge their consciousness. And so we treat them like they're disposable. And yet, you know, we're, we're sort of 
um, we're conferring upon them a terrible existence and then and then just killing them randomly and that would be a moral catastrophe so i do think the epistemological question is important so why i mean this is a also a version of what ben said at the very beginning of his session why are we less willing to defer to experts when it comes to consciousness about ai and i think the answer has to do with imagination Right? So I think that the very thing that gets us interested in robot and artificial consciousness is the thing that, in some sense, leads us astray. So, right, in, you know, I was this way when I was young, right? I watch lots of science fiction and I see lots of movies about uh, robots that are conscious, right? Robots that enjoy consciousness. So. You know, there's Marvin, the depressed Martian from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There's BB-8. There's the Terminator, and then the oldest one I think there is is uh, is from the movie Short Circuit. So that was that's number five in the upper left. So I think that we are able to use our imaginations to sort of attribute consciousness very, very, very broadly, to the point where we can you know attribute to consciousness to things like teapots or sort of beings that have no bodies or disembodied things, right? So that teapot is from Beauty and the Beast, right? So it's supposed to be that we have singing, we have conscious teapots and candelabras and clocks. In the movie Her, Samantha is supposed to be a conscious, I think we're supposed to think that Samantha is a conscious being that is kind of has no body. Uh, there's the agents in the matrix and then there's the ghosts in many movies, including Harry and many, many fictional stories, including Harry Potter. So I think uh, with our, you know, imagination allows us to sort of, we're, it's very easy to imagine that any entity, no matter how simple, is conscious, and that just about any entity, no matter how complex, is not conscious, right? So we're able to sort of, in our imaginings and in our fictions, able to imagine very simple items that are conscious and very complex creatures that are not conscious. So I, I think there's a kind of, our imagination gives us this kind of dualist intuition. So it's this intuition that we can sort of, whatever the entity is, we can sort of add or take away consciousness from it. It's very easy to do in imagination. So I think part of the challenge in philosophy is to kind of explain away that dualist intuition and explain why it is that we should be cautious in the way that Ben was recommending uh, about using intuitions. And so I think that that involves kind of coming up with some guidelines for how we, how we think about these things and the kinds of thought experiments we allow to inform our philosophical thinking. So I want to distinguish roughly between sort of two ways of thinking about using imagination. One is as a general claim about fallibility, right? So that's Doug Portmore in the picture. He's a consequentialist and Doug's a reasonable guy. So he's gonna acknowledge that there's, he's a consequentialist, but there's, he's gonna acknowledge some possibility that he's mistaken, right? And that's just the general acknowledgement of human fallibility. It's like, well, I think this, but I, I could be wrong. I think that's different from thinking about genuine cases that Doug needs to consider in his theorizing right, in his deciding which moral theory is correct, right? So if you've done any moral theorizing, you might've heard about the transplant case, person walks into the hospital, he's a perfect match for five patients, right? Can you kill the one person and harvest their organs and save five, right? So it's a version of the trolley problem. And it seems like that might be the kind of case that someone needs to take seriously in their, in their theorizing, but the general acknowledgement of fallibility isn't something that you need to take seriously in your theorizing. It's just kind of an acknowledgement of the human condition. So, you know, I, I think Ben is conscious. I'm not 100% certain of it, so I could be wrong. I mean, I can imagine that Ben is not conscious. So I can imagine that Ben is saying all these things and doing all these things, even though it's all dark inside for Ben. Um, now, I could also imagine that Ben is not conscious and think, well, that's a, that's a possibility that I need to take seriously in my theorizing. Um, so that's a, that's, an, that's a genuine possibility that I nor need, nor, 
I need to account for in my theorizing about consciousness, that somebody could be exactly like Ben and not be conscious. And so I think with human beings, we're more willing to just say, oh, I, the fact that I can imagine that Ben is not conscious is an expression of my fallibilism. I don't need to take seriously the possibility, the genuine possibility that Ben's not conscious, that there, you know, that a being that is exact, you know, that has his exact physiology is not conscious. I don't, I don't need to take that seriously in my theorizing about consciousness. But with artificial beings, we have the same two possibilities. But I think that at least right now, we're more led towards the second possibility of saying, oh, look, the possibility that this artificial being is genuinely non, it's all dark inside for it. That's a possibility that I need to take seriously. Right? So part of what's going on here is sort of making it clear, going back to this one, the idea is that in some sense, part of the reason that I think Ben is conscious is that it's the best explanation of, it best explain and best predicts his behavior. And that's in part, a willingness to defer to our best science about the best way to explain and predict Ben's behavior. So with artificial beings, you kind of want to clear the way so that we can say, we should just defer to what our best scientists say about whether, about whether this artificial being is conscious. Now there's not scientific consensus now, but if we look forward to the future, maybe we'll converge on some kind of scientific consensus along the lines that Ben and Bernie were, were sketching so we want to make clear why it is that the intuitions that we might have about robot, about robot consciousness are actually misleading and that we really should treat robot consciousness not differently from the way that we treat human consciousness or non-human animal consciousness. Okay, and that's, uh, so that's what I have. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to move into the Q&A portion of our event. So if anyone has any remaining questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and the professors can answer them. Um, so we have a couple of them, so I'll move it over to the co-hosts to handle that. Um, but yeah, you guys can keep asking them throughout the discussion. You wanna go ahead and start Jackson? For sure. So the first question that looked like I received was, well, Dr. Philip was talking, it was from Eric. The question was, some people make a distinction between one, being rational in an awareness way, and two, being rational in a functional slash performance slash calculation way. And uh, the question is just to elaborate further on that distinction. Okay, so the distinction was, um... Yeah, I'm quite, not quite getting the distinction. Um, maybe Bernie or PD can help me out here. Can you, can you say it again, Jackson? Yeah, say it again? Yes, of course. Uh, distinction between being rational in an awareness way, I'm imagining being like aware of your own self, aware of things that probably more subjective versus being rational in a functional slash performance way. Would it, would it be Maybe. okay to would it be okay to change the question instead of rational use the word conscious? Uh, I imagine so. Okay, I think I get I think I get the question. Yeah, so we didn't really talk about this, but you might I mean there's you might distinguish between consciousness and just having mental states in the first place, right? And so you might think it's possible for AI to have mental states without having any conscious mental states. States. So the dominant view in cognitive science is that you know, the vast majority of our mental processing occurs at an unconscious level. And for some reason, some of those mental states, um, you know, percolate their way to the surface or whatever and become conscious. And it's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah, you might think that you can perform actions, act on beliefs and desires and solve some pretty sophisticated problems with it, without any of those steps being consciously performed. So just think about when you um, perform an action automatically, right? When you're driving, it's a pretty sophisticated series of actions, driving from 
one side of town to the other. And yet you might have been daydreaming. You might have not have consciously made the decision to turn left here and then right here and so on. So it seems like a lot of our actions, when they become automatic, they become un unconscious. And yet they're, they're still very computationally sophisticated actions. So, yeah, you might think, okay, a lot of these AI, maybe you think that the, the bar is pretty low for AI systems having mental states, having genuine minds, the real thing, real intelligence. But maybe you think there's something extra special about consciousness. Um, and that's just a very difficult question that no one really knows the answer to, right? Um, maybe Bernie could talk about this. So Bernie was suggesting in um, his talk that to have genuine intelligence, maybe there has to be some degree of consciousness in entering into the picture somewhere. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could talk about that, Bernie, to help out. Uh, well, uh, one standard view in philosophy of mind is that uh, there are two criteria for uh, the metaphysics of what it is to be a mental state. And one is intentionality, that it's about something. And another is that it's conscious, that there's something that it's like to be in that state. For example, in the introductory textbook, Philosophy of Mind by Jaeguan Kim, he's got a kind of Venn diagram with two circles and one is intentional and one is conscious and then in the intersection, those are the conscious intentional states. But on the left, there are the uh, intentional states that are not conscious. And on the right, there are the conscious states that are not intentional. So my picture is different. My picture is that all mental states are conscious or potentially conscious. And so consciousness is more of a foundational criterion. And uh, some mental states that are both conscious and intentional, and an even smaller set of those are not only conscious and intentional, but rational and so on. So um, I think that um, I'm guessing that Ben has a different picture. I'm guessing that Ben would not agree that all mental states are uh, foundationally conscious or potentially conscious. I'm guessing that Ben is more like the standard picture in philosophy where an intentional state that isn't conscious or even potentially conscious would still be a mental state and perhaps even a rational state. Thank you. And we have uh, another question. Uh, this one appears to me to be more open-ended, but I believe it was asked while Dr. Phillips was talking. The question is, should AGI be achieved? How would it be classified to the degree as to humans based upon the idea of human rights? Would they also achieve the same level of rights? Should they be similar or the same as human consciousness? Yeah, great question. So I think they should have exactly the same rights, all and only the same rights as human beings. Um, uh, yeah, I, had, I mean, I, I, I struggle to think of a reason why you would accord AGI, that is functionally identical to a human, um, different rights. Um, I mean, maybe there are going to be some diff different, different ways we'll treat them um, based on where they came from. Um, there may be some relevant differences, but in general, yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought that there'd be any reason for um, having an asymmetry. Peter, did you ever? A... Just thought. Uh, so I think some people have written about this question whether the the effect of duplicability on how we think about rights. So you know, if you have a a being that is sort of endlessly duplicable. Kind of copyable without error could it perhaps be less tragic if one of the duplicates is killed so if, you know if i could just like press a button and make a million bends like okay and like ben 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 uh and sort of everyone has bends the, the same richness of conscious experience the same apparent memories the same then it 
you might feel like it's less tragic if one of the bends, right? If we're just like, all right, let's delete that. You know, there's like, we don't have enough pizza. Let's delete one of the bends, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, I think there's questions that sort of non, you know, these AI, AI consciousness does raise particularly when you start to get into AIs that have, where it looks like their individuality doesn't work like human individuality. So, so far we've been talking about creatures that are very much like human beings or possibly modeled on human beings. So the A AGI that Ben described is one that's functionally identical to a human being, but you can of course at least envision cases where perhaps sort of different machines or different programs could share states. Uh, so we can have questions about maybe there might be some differences as, as the kind of our sense of what, whether a robot is an individual or a collective, um, that could change the way we think about its rights. And then we might think that the duplicate duplicability changes our, how we how we should think about its rights. Mm -hmm. uh, a related question um, is uh, um, if you think about science fictions, for example, the restaurant at the end of the universe by Douglas Adams, where there's a, I believe a cow that uh, wants to be eaten. So the cow is alive and rational. It explains to the restaurant goer what its best parts are after it's killed. Or in the TV series, The Good Place, there's a, an AI that wants to be, or doesn't mind being turned off. Now, if there was a human being who wanted to be killed or didn't mind if you killed it, I think we would say that it would be highly unethical to uh, accede to its wishes or to kill it. But it's less clear in the case of a generic type of AI that doesn't mind being turned off. So uh, species membership or type membership seems to me to make a difference. If we had a million AIs, all of which didn't mind at all to be turned off, then it might be perfectly ethical to turn them off. But if there was a human being who didn't mind being killed, it would be highly unethical to kill it. So to uh, combine two questions we have that are very similar, it goes on to the ethics as well. And so Jared uh, asks, people have argued the possibility of a moral catastrophe. Uh, should we, uh, should this keep us from creating conscious AIs at all? Uh, do you have any thoughts about whether creating or attempting to create deserves any moral consideration? And that kind of goes hand in hand with Brandon who asks if there should be any sort of uh, legislation for AI regulation and creation. And that was open to uh, Kung and then everyone else afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a question there in the chat as well about whether it would be better to, to uh, kind of prohibit development of AI, to avoid moral catastrophe, to prohibit development of AI until we have a kind of worked, well worked out theory of consciousness about what, co what comprises machine intelligence. So I think that, you know, the, the question by Alex Holzer is, I think that part of the problem is that we might not know what the right theory of artificial consciousness is in the absence of doing consciousness research. So part of the idea is that we only figure out these things by doing the research, by trying to create the, these artificial beings, programming them, trying to, you know, basically doing the work of science and trying to develop them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess once we start to get closer to what we think of as kind of creating, you know, creating conscious creatures, certainly there will be, there, there are going to be ethical considerations there. Uh, and they might mirror a kind of rethinking about how we think of creating, you know, human consciousness, right? So 
I have a former colleague named um, Rivka Weinberg who's written all sorts of interesting papers about basically why people should not be so cavalier in bringing human beings into the world. That that's like an enormous responsibility that people tend to, tend to treat in a really cavalier way. And that, you know, so we might start to think, rethink procreation ethics more broadly to include, to sort of have our theories about, have, have our thoughts about how we think about creating new artificial conscious beings kind of partly inform how we think about the ethics of creating human conscious beings. You know, do you guys have any, yeah. any thoughts? Um, so, so yeah, I think that's right about procreation ethics and expanding it. Um, one kind of concern would be for the sake of the AIs themselves. And another kind of concern would be for the risks that the AIs pose to humans. So I think that the first kind of concern is really theoretical and can be put off to the distant future. That is the concern for the AIs themselves. I don't think it would be appropriate to use that as a reason for legislation to restrict or control AI research. But the second kind of concern, what kind of risks do AIs pose to humans? We should be thinking about that now. Uh, for example, the risks to privacy and uh, the risks to AI to, to malicious uh, actions that would disrupt our technological systems, our technological infrastructure. Um, I think that um, we need to be thinking now about what kinds of risks those pose. Uh, privacy risks are foremost among them, but uh, in the not too distant future, risks to what it could do to our infrastructure in the Internet of Things, uh, I think it's uh, political risks, risks to the distribution of politically potent information or misinformation. Those are risks to humans that we need to think about now. So we had a two part question from Professor Thad Botham. Uh, it says, uh, do you think being conscious entails being alive? And the second part, if so, do you think being alive requires having a capacity to reproduce? And this is open to all panelists. Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question and I'll give it a conjectural answer. Um, I think that um, just as I advocated a kind of cautiously optimistic agnosticism about artificial intelligence, about genuine artificial intelligence. Uh, similarly, I'd advocate a cautiously optimistic agnosticism about artificial life, that is, creating life forms that have a radically different underlying material nature that isn't based on DNA or the ability to reproduce or to um, metabolize energy. Um, I don't think we know, uh, I don't think anybody knows what the different kinds of life are. Uh, just as I don't think anybody knows what the different kinds of intelligence are. So I'm attracted to a hierarchical view of the cosmos on which uh, some kinds of living things give rise to intelligence or to consciousness. And um, it would be neat, it would be theoretically neat if only living things could give rise to consciousness. And so I am attracted to that position. And so I think it's 
not at all implausible that only living things could be conscious and that only living things could be intelligent so long as we also acknowledge that um, we are right now radically ignorant about this potential scope of life, whether there could be living things that have a very different biology from terrestrial living things. Thank you. And, oh, I'm sorry, was someone going to add something? No. I have a question from Stephen Hoyt. Given Searle's confidence in the impossibility of strong AI, are his grounds really themselves motivating? And in answering that, I think for the benefit of um, some other people here, if you could go on what Searle believes also. Thank you. Okay. Shall I say something about that? Or Ben, do you want to jump in? You can stop and I'll add something. Okay. Um, well, as most of you know, Searle had a famous Chinese room thought experiment where you have some set of books that contain all of the functional rules for processing inputs and mediating the internal states that then generally lead to out outputs. And Searle argued that um, he himself could be in such a room and follow all the rules, um, but he would not understand any of the rational processes that the room seemed to have to outside observers. And uh, so many people think that's a persuasive argument. Uh, I don't think it's very persuasive, especially when you understand that Searle also extended it to the kinds of rules that could be in uh, very non-standard forms of AI. So a neural network he thought also was subject to a kind of Chinese room debunking thought experiment, or indeed any kind of AI architecture could be instantiated in Searle's thought experiment. And so the way Searle used it it would seem to entail that no future AI could be conscious. I don't know if Searle would accept that consequence, but I claim it is a consequence of his thought experiment and of the way he extended it to neural networks. Uh, so I think that's wrong. Um, it's a bad argument. On the other hand, I am somewhat sympathetic to the motivating idea which is that there's some constitutive connection between intelligence or mentality and consciousness. So I am a Searleyan in spirit. I have a Surly spirit, but I don't accept the famous Chinese room thought experiment. Yeah, so I, I agree with Bernie. I, I think it's a really bad argument. I think it's an interesting argument and a good starting point for debates about um, the mind and consciousness. But this is one of these arguments with a premise that uses an intuition as evidence, right? He thinks it's just obvious that these systems that are you know, computationally identical to humans um, don't have real mental states, let alone consciousness. And so unless you have an independent story about why our intuitions about the scope of consciousness are reliable, um, I don't see why you would give those intuitions any weight whatsoever. Um, so yeah, for me, those are bad arguments, right? Um, I think that we should be looking for the kinds of behaviors and neurophysiological processes that um, correlate with consciousness. And that should be our starting point, like Peter was sketching before, for theorizing about consciousness and its scope. Um, So we had a question from Daniel Ford asking about relation to the human rights question. Uh, he asks whether or not an AI would need to have a conscious level where they would be able to suffer. Uh, is consciousness implying that the being itself can suffer? 
Yeah, I was going to say something briefly in my little talk. Um, so you could have an AGI, right, that doesn't have any um, mechanisms for um, so any pain mechanisms, right? So maybe it has flexible problem solving, domain general problem solving mechanisms, um, but doesn't need to have uh, mechanisms for feeling pain, right? Um, and we know that humans, right, people with um, pain asymbolia or congenital insensitivity to pain, they lack the capacity to um, feel the unpleasantness of bodily damage, right? So you could you could you, know, you could you could construct AI in principle, right, that have general intelligence but not the capacity for suffering. If we mean it in that narrow sense, we mean you know physical pain, um, and so they might be um, AI systems that have fewer rights than humans or different rights, like um, be another consideration. Um, but um, if you talk about suffering more broadly, you might talk about just having goals and desires, right? That can be frustrated. And so even if these AI systems don't experience pain because they're not processing information in the right way, they might still have goals that could be frustrated and that could be a, like a suffering in a broader sense. Um, and so I think that would confer various rights on those, um, those AI systems. Ben, could there be an AGI that has goals and uh and yet there's it has no um, negative conscious negatively valenced conscious states associated with the frustration of those goals so the goals guide its behavior but it experiences nothing like sadness pain or suffering when those goals are frustrated? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm really not sure what to say about that. So there, you know, there are similar questions people ask about um, you know, invertebrates and fish and whether they have that effective component of pain. Mm -hmm. um, so like the negative valence. Um, so yeah, you could ask the same thing about frustrated desires. Um, what do we say about those kinds of cases? Yeah, I'd probably wheel in a, some sort of precautionary principle there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah. we, Peter, you... haven't, we haven't talked much about kind of autonomy. Uh, so you might, might, I mean, there could be theories on which, you know, machine intelligence is orthogonal to the autonomy, but you might think if, you know, uh, there's a robot that's genuinely autonomous, that it has desires of its own, that would be wrong to sort of needlessly frustrate those desires, even if it didn't cause it distress. I think that's probably how we would treat human beings who didn't feel distress. Like, well, look, it would be, be wrong to sort of screw with a human being, who, even if they didn't feel distress about it, to just screw with the, you know, constantly thwart their desires um, just for your own amusement, even if it didn't, you know, even if they didn't have those sort of affective states that where they're like, I dislike that. Uh, but there's something about, you know, we, we do seem to put some value on autonomy and being able to carry out your, carry out your plans, like live your life as you, to be self-governing. So. Yeah, it's interesting that those are historically uh, two broad, distinct broad traditions for grounding moral status. One, the capacity for suffering and two, uh, rational autonomy. And Peter's noting that they can come apart. You can have rational autonomy without um, the capacity to suffer. Probably the other dissociation is also possible. That is the capacity to suffer without moral autonomy. Uh, that, that's an interesting and deep question. Um, I'm inclined to doubt that you can really have rational autonomy without consciousness. Um, but um, I'm much less confident about the claim that you can have rational autonomy without the capacity to suffer or feel pain. Um, so I don't know, that's a serious and interesting question. And I, uh, and I don't know what to say about that. Thank you.
We have a question from Corey Drowsdowski. Could you say more about the idea of an AI being conscious as it surprises us and how we would distinguish between the ways that we are surprised now and the way where the best explanation would be that it is conscious? Because certainly AI systems have surprised us in the past, but it seems questionable whether those are conscious. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's right. I think it's an interesting question. Um, the, uh, I think that there was the first time uh, historically that an AI theorist said he was surprised uh, was already back in the 1950s, just a few years into uh, the AI era when a researcher named Arthur Samuels created a checker playing machine that then beat him. He had created the machine, but the machine was better at checkers than he was. So that's a kind of surprise. Um, people were surprised that the machine could play checkers that well and kind of surprised that it could beat the creator. And one of the early arguments given against the old saying that a computer will only do what you tell it to do. Um, so there was a level of explanation where this checker playing machine was doing something that its creator, Arthur Samuels, had not told it to do. He had indeed told it, uh, programmed it at some lower level of processing, but he had not programmed uh, the, the higher level powers for making good moves that the, uh, that the machine was capable of. So that was a surprise. But it's not the kind of surprise that would make anyone think that the machine was conscious. It might be thought of, as some people think of it as um, programming it to find, uh, to, to find a path through a multi-dimensional space of possibilities. And some people are doubtful about um, the deep learning AIs that are currently being developed on the grounds that um, there's a way to explain what they do in modeling what they do as uh, a kind of sophisticated curve fitting, finding a path through a multi-dimensional state space. And that kind of explanation does not seem to require attributing any kind of consciousness to the AI. So my thought was that therefore we currently have no reason to think that any existing AI has any degree of consciousness, even though they do surprise us. Now, I think it's possible and perhaps even likely that in the future, there will be other kinds of surprises that can't be analogized to finding a, to curve fitting in a multidimensional state space. And that the only way to have a high level understanding of what the machine is doing is to say, the machine is consciously sensing this color or the machine is consciously frustrated at its goals not being satisfied. Um, I, I don't know how to make that more specific, but I think there's something to that. And so that's all I can say about it right now. So uh, Professor Kung, it looks like you wanted to ans ask, answer uh, Mark's question about what leads us to believe that anything, whether a creature or technological device, uh, whose creature slash type device uh, does not have consciousness can gain consciousness. Have we ever transferred a consciousness into another object? If you'd like to go ahead and answer that. I believe you're muted still, sir. Sorry about that. I might have clicked that accidentally. So let me let me just reread the question. Um, 
So I think so far we haven't talked about uh, creatures gaining consciousness, right? So it's not like a, you know, there's that, if you've seen the matrix, there's that scene in the matrix where Keanu Reeves like plugs in, he's like, oh, I, you know, he runs this program. He's like, oh, I know Kung Fu, where you could take something that isn't conscious and then sort of confer consciousness on it like a Pinocchio kind of situation where you're just like, okay, I'm going to, you know, sprink, give you the magic, the magic touch and you become conscious. So we've kind of been operating under the unstated assumption that consciousness is a function that consciousness, whether a thing is conscious is either a function of how it's physically constituted or uh, on how it functions. Right. So what, how is it, processing information or what sort of stuff is it made out of? Is it right out, made out of the right materials or is it processing information in the right way? Um, and that means that, you know, you can't just give that to something that doesn't already have it. So like, you know, giving a wooden, a wooden marionette consciousness would involve enormous changes in it, right? You just can't, can't confer, uh, you can't confer something on it. And then there's this, question that we you know we don't i don't think any of us feel like we have a great answer to which is well how will you, you know how, how what 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 will it actually take for the you know what when you how will you know when you're done when you've made enough changes to make the thing conscious and then you know bernie was giving this answer that says like well look if our best experiments of our best scientific theorizing make us think that the best way to explain and predict this creature's behavior is by attributing conscious states to it then we should think that it's conscious. Um, and I guess, you know, Tad put a, a Tad put a question in the chat about a case where somebody has conscious experiences but doesn't have a brain. And so that's the kind of case that you would have to end, you know, that would have to enter into your theorizing. So there's a really interesting paper by some interesting papers by Barbara Montero that says, you know, could science in principle prove that dualism is true? And it seems like, you know, this is a question about how you define physicalism, how you define dualism, but, you know, if there are enough cases like the cases that 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 Tad, that, Tad, that Professor Botham was describing, that might let, lead you to think that some kind of dualism is true. Um, where that could even, that could mean something like a sort of a full on substance dualism where you think that consciousness is associated with having an immortal soul, or it could be some a, a kind of dualism which says that, look, consciousness is sort of a, a fundamental property of the universe, like spin and charm and gravity, right? It's just, it can't be explained in, ter in any other terms. But if we are to think that dualism is true, you know, the idea is, I think the model that I've been thinking about the way I've been thinking about it is like, well, that could be because we think that our best science tells us that, you know, that dualism is true, either because it, it, we come across, we continually come across surprising cases like the ones that Professor Botham put in the chat, or because we think that our best scientific explanation of people's behavior appeals to some new, new fundamental force, which we can only describe as consciousness. Some people uh, talk about Turing tests for consciousness. Um, as um, many of you know, Alan Turing in 1950 proposed a conversational competence test for intelligence. Turing also used the word consciousness in that same paper. So it was a conversational competence test for consciousness. And many arguments have been given to debunk that and it's no longer taken very seriously. But the, still the thought remains, we might have some kind of uh, neo-Turing test for consciousness, what would it be? Uh, I, one sufficient condition one can imagine, uh, if you programmed a computer to use Quelia language, if you programmed it specifically to use Quelia language to talk about Quelia and to theorize about consciousness, then the best explanation for its powers to do so would be that you had programmed it 
to use those words in an intelligent way, but that would not entail that it actually had those qualitative states. Now let's imagine a different scenario. You program it without any intention to have it use qualitative language about its own states. And then it surprises you with its uh, suddenly starting to theorize about qualia. Well, that would be one example, uh, an extreme one, no doubt, but a proof in principle. Uh, if it happened, it would be a proof in principle that a computer could be conscious. Um, maybe it's not the only way in which we could be surprised, but it is uh, surprised so that we attribute consciousness, but it is a way in which we could be surprised uh, into believing that it was conscious. The spontaneous development of uh, the language of qualia by an AGI that we did not expect and did not program into it in any direct way uh, would be a sufficient, um, epistemically sufficient condition for attributing consciousness. And it would give us reason to think that it metaphysically was conscious. I guess, Bernie, you'd have to sort of make sure that the, the system wasn't just listening to other humans talk about their qualitative states and just sort of mimicking, right? You'd have to some sort of somehow control for that. So it'd be like maybe an isolated yeah. AI that you're only, you're, you're the only one conversing with and suddenly it just starts. Right. You know how it feels. Yeah. yeah. So we actually have a question from Nadia asking about whether or not you could combine an AI consciousness with, she says natural intelligence, but I assume that means like human consciousness uh, to create a hybrid consciousness. Do you think that's possible? Um, uh, yes, I do. I think that's an, a fascinating and very promising uh, possibility, one that I expect to see increasingly realized in my lifetime, even though I'm already old. So I think that um, uh, we're already, I, I believe in the extended mind thesis that uh, was put forward in a famous paper by David Chalmers and Andy Clark. And according to that thesis, the um, material substructure of your mental processes can extend outside of your body and into the technology that enables you to think, for example, your cell phone. Um, and so we already have uh, a type of hybrid intelligence. Um, I, the, there are some criteria of uh, reliability and assent to the information that's instantiated in the external device, but and those are gonna get more and more um, satisfied by, uh, inc by technology in the next uh, uh, one, two, two decades or so. Uh, so I think that uh, these will be, I don't know if hybrid is the right word, maybe it is, but it's gonna be, my intelligence is gonna be radically expanded by machines that I incorporate into my mind. We have a question from Jay Panagi uh, directed to Dr. Phillips. He says, Dr. Phillips, you spent some time explaining that the integration of systems is an indicator of consciousness. I think you mentioned some claim that the internet is conscious. Do you think that claim is plausible? Sorry, what was that? The what's conscious? The internet. Oh, the internet. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so that could be sort of an uncomfortable consequence of my claim. Um, so I, I think we have to think harder about what type of integrative processing we're talking about. Um, I mean, you might think the internet's just this big, huge network of just uh, semi-integrated processors, and you need some, some something like a CPU, something like a central processing unit that is, um, in some sense, tying together the processing and all these other systems. Um, I mean, if you think that the internet is um, 
conscious, then um, some people have wondered whether nations are conscious, right? Because, you know, just think about the US, we've got people talking to one another, we've got information coming out of here, going, going into your, um, through your sensory transducers and being processed. So why wouldn't you say that the US as a nation is itself a conscious thing? Um, yeah, so I don't have a good answer to that um, question. Um, of course, my intuition is no, but I've said before that I don't trust my intuitions about the scope of consciousness. Um, maybe, maybe I would say something like it's it's possible that the U.S. is conscious and the internet is consciousness, but the, but the, but maybe that doesn't have any sort of drastic ethical ramifications because the internet can't experience pain, for example. Um, the internet doesn't have isn't like a, an autonomous being with goals, identifiable goals and desires. So maybe it could be a surprising consequence of certain theories that the internet is conscious, but maybe it's just not the type of conscious being that we should um, care about in the sense of like conferring certain rights on it and worrying about harming the internet. Maybe it's just sort of this inert type of consciousness that's just out there and it's just interesting. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a very live possibility for me. Um, what, what about the, um, the following entity? Uh, the Twitterverse plus all the people who make up the Twitterverse. So there's a big chaotic entity that has a lot of resemblances to a human brain. There's, uh, it's, it's, or maybe an octopus's brain where it's just, there are some distributed clumps, but there's also this connecting stuff. Right. Um, we see Twitter storms, which are like brainstorms in some abstract way. So um, even though I doubt that any such entity is conscious, the one example that gives me the most pause is the case of the Twitterverse plus the Twitter people. So yeah, the, the, my rough initial thought is that you have to have the right sort of integration. You have to, um, the integration has to be such that there are identifiable goals and desires, right? And so I'm not sure to explain the various phenomena that you observe with the Twitterverse. Um, there's, there's no justification for identifying some um, goals and desires that those various processes are organized around. Um, whereas clearly in the case of a human being or an AGI, you can, um, observe the integration and posit various goals and behaviors to make sense of the behavior. So the information is integrated in a way that is geared towards allowing the organism or the AI system to satisfy its goals based on its beliefs. And I just don't think you get that with Twitterverse or the internet, mm -hmm. the US. And so that's why I don't, I don't worry about the internet, that the internet is conscious and maybe it's got certain rights and so on um, because it, it doesn't have the right type of consciousness. Um, a, a human being who takes uh, a strong psychedelic or who suffers a certain kind of um, mental illness might still be conscious, but lose a lot of its integration of his, his or her integration. So people talk about, uh, I was listening to uh, an interview with Michael Pollan about the psychotherapeutic use of uh, LSD and other psychogenic drugs. And he thought it was beneficial to have yourself disintegrated uh, now and then. Um, and that um, although it wouldn't be a good to have that as your permanent state, that to be aware of this possibility could have psychotherapeutic benefits. So that made vivid to me the possibility of a conscious being that wasn't organized in the standard way around an integrated self. Yeah, so I think those are problem cases for this particular approach. Um, so as I said before, I think you know, at the very least, this is a, a credible indicator of consciousness. It has to be taken seriously. And so if you have, you're developing something like a precautionary principle, we have to um, give those kinds of systems the benefit of the doubt. But yeah, I think you're totally right that these could be counterexamples. And so maybe 
in terms of which is the correct theory of consciousness. Maybe um, that would be a, a strike against those particular theories, but um, yeah, so um, every theory of consciousness is going to have its um, problem cases. And yeah, I think you're right that there are definitely problem cases for the integration based approaches. Um, yeah, for sure. I don't know what to say about those cases. Yeah. So. yeah. But uh, Eric Schwitzgabel believes in crazyism and that means that the problems of mentality and consciousness are so difficult that the right answer is going to look crazy. That kind of takes us to another question Joel had about uh, whether or not you believe you can switch consciousness on and off. You talked a lot about like having different forms of consciousness and he brings up specifically uh, whether a human being that's under anesthesia would have consciousness or not. Yeah, um, so uh, anesthesia is generally taken to be the dissolution of consciousness, that is the consciousness is absent. Um, Recently, I think people have come to be much more cautious about that judgment. Um, I think anesthesia dampens uh, or turns off a kind of uh, circuit between the cortex and the thalamus that, um, uh, that then it com comes back after you, the anesthetic wears off. Um, some people do surprisingly report memories from anesthesia after coming out of anesthesia. And so maybe, um, although they looked like they were un totally unconscious, maybe they weren't really totally unconscious. Um, there's a, a lot of recent work coming out of Western University in London, Canada, um, for, uh, with I think a guy named Owen on people in uh, vegetative states where he has found evidence for uh, consciousness that we didn't previously suspect in people who are in, in uh, persistent long-term comas. So it's possible, and I, indeed I think it's likely that there is some consciousness in those people, perhaps even in us when we're, in, when we're sleeping, Perhaps even when we're in a dreamless sleep, there might be some kind of conscious phenomenology going on. A person in a dreamless sleep will often twist or turn his body, his or her body, in response to uh, uh, painful stimuli in the joints. At least that's a tendentious description, but I think it's plausible that even in a dreamless sleep, you can feel a pain in your joints and that causes you to turn your body from one side to the other. We have a question from Zachary Baker Camacho. He's asking under what conditions would we attribute emotion to an AGI or a different sort of AI? And would it make sense to attribute emotion to AI at all? Then your audio. Oops. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll go back to my um, case study involving the AGI that's a functional duplicate of a human being. So um, in that case, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't attribute emotions to the system. And it's hard to think of evidence that would count against it having certain emotions. So you could use all the same behavioral um, hallmarks of say anger or, or pain um, or jealousy, and you'll get the same behaviors occurring with this AGI system. Um, I mean, the only difference is gonna be just the, the hardware, right? And so I don't see how that's a, a relevant difference. Um, you know, so we talk about um, non-human animals experiencing emotions. Um, I guess that's somewhat controversial and certainly 
non-human animals don't have the same physiology as us. And so there are good reasons coming out of comparative psychology for thinking that emotions are multiply realizable in the sense that you can have different physiologies giving rise to the same types of emotions. Um, and so for that reason, I don't think that um, the, you know, the, the physiology of this AGI um, counts against it having emotions. Um, yeah, so I'm just sort of re restating my, the main line I took before. Um, I guess in, lines on that? So in the case of uh, bees, they can get agitated and a lot of entomologists believe that the bees are angry and they use that in a quite literal sense that they have the phenomenal experience of anger and so that strikes me as plausible and it also strikes me as plausible that a feature of uh, ordinary background consciousness is a certain feeling of well-being and when that goes away, there's the converse experience of depression. So I don't think there's any some is anything like that in any current AI. There's nothing to suggest that it gets angry and that I'm aware of. And there's nothing to suggest that its ordinary background state involves a feeling of well-being. And there's nothing to suggest that when that goes wrong, it's depressed. But I think that uh, a future AI might very well um, exit, surprise us. I mean, if we program in a simulation of anger, well-being, or depression, we'll say, well, well, that's because you programmed that in. At the level of description, anger, uh, well-being, depression. Now, if you program it to modify itself through a kind of neural architecture, and then you're surprised to discover that it looks angry, or you're surprised to discover that it seems to have a feeling that it seems to have well being, or surprised to discover that when things go wrong, it's depressed, then that would make me think it was reasonable to believe that it was angry or had well-being or was depressed. So Dr. Phillips, uh, Wyatt has a question of, do you believe the integration of information which is considered consciousness requires an inner monologue? Yeah, so yeah, as I said before, I mean, this is not, um, I think this is a, a credible indicator, a plausible indicator of consciousness. I don't think this is necessarily the correct theory. Um, I mean, there are theories called the, you know, there's a theory called the integration information theory. Um, and there are various other theories that are inspired by the same basic idea. So there's a very popular theory called the global broadcasting, the gro global broadcast theory. I said that right? Yeah. And so the thought there is that, okay, let's just talk about visual experiences. So, you know, there are conditions called, there's a condition called blindsight where the person gets damaged to their visual cortex and they no longer seem to have conscious visual experiences of the objects in front of them. And yet they can still move out of the way of objects and, and manipulate them in various ways. So it looks like we can have unconscious visual processes. Um, what makes it conscious? Well, a very popular view is that if the output of your visual state is available for processing in your other cognitive systems, such as your memory systems, the centers for like verbal report, um, your motor systems and so on. That's what sort of lights it up and makes that visual state conscious. So on that view, um, you, um, some of those systems that could consume the outputs of your visual systems include systems responsible for metacognition, for thinking about your own mental states. So you could have the thought, I'm currently visually experiencing the color red or whatever. And that would be something like an inner monologue, inner monologue you know, metacognition, self-awareness. But that would just be one example of another system consuming the outputs of a visual process. I don't think on these global broadcasting views that's necessary. So you could maybe not be a creature that has metacognitive capacities, the capacity to have things like inner speech and thinking about your own mental states. So long as you have all these other cognitive systems and this output gets 
is available to them all, then I think it's possible to, for that state to become conscious. So in other words, on, on those views, um, having something like an inner monologue, metacognition would be one way, one piece of evidence for it being conscious, but not necessarily like a necessary ingredient. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we're going to cut in. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we had a lot of great questions, but unfortunately we only have the room until 5.30. So to just close the event, I wanted to thank everyone for coming. I wanted to thank Dr. Kobus, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Kung for coming and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, it was super interesting and I really enjoyed being here. Um, thank you to Rachel and the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies for allowing us to have this event. And then finally, thank you to all of our participants. Um, we loved having you guys and it is super important to stay connected even during this difficult time and we really appreciate you all being here. Um, have a wonderful rest of your evening, and we will see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Rachel. And Peter, you must have precognitive abilities because you incorporated into your slides some of the points that I and Ben had made. Yes. That was enormously impressive. Yes. Very spooky, Peter. Yeah. Eerie. Thank you so much, Isabella. Yeah, thanks and thanks to everyone who organized. It was really a lot of fun. Questions? Good fun. Thank you guys.